ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهي لنا من أمرنا رشدا وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد النبي النمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته So continuing our discussion of Surah Al-Kahf Last week we began with a basic introduction on the science of tafsir and then we spoke about the basmalah and then the beginning of the first ayah Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja So what we mentioned about the basmalah that it's the phrase of ontological dependence Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Al-alamu bismillah everything other than Allah only exists because of Allah. Al-alamu refers to everything other than Allah. And so the ba there is the basis of its very being. The basis of the being of the world is Allah, the, the name of Allah, meaning Allah himself. And because, <clears throat> because the world is Allah's creative act, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, in that light, Imam al-Qushayri, who has a tafsir called Lata'if al-Isharat, the subtleties of illusions and uh, so there's two there's two types of uh, tafsir in a sense there's tafsir proper which is the the standard exegesis of the Quran it's called tafsir sometimes in the early times it was called tawil or interpretation and there's a second type or a second genre a subgenre called ishara and the ishara is illusions or uh, lessons for one's spiritual journey and these are these these never replace the tafsir proper, the ishara that a a scholar or person of Allah draws from the Quran while they're reading the Quran. It's never to replace the outward exegesis of the Quran, but it's only a an addition, as it were. It's something to to uh, to comment in addition to with respect to the Quran. So uh, the as opposed to what's called esoteric, like botany, botanism. So the, the botany, you know, the, the esoterists who had this, they, they focused on, they claimed to focus on inward meanings of the Quran, they did so to replace the outward meanings. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, aqimu salat, establish the prayer. The standard proper tafsir of that verse is clear and known to every Muslim, which is to, Pray the five prayers every day on time. Aqimu salah, you know, make the prayer stand literally, i.e., establish it such that it is fixed in one's life. There's no doubt of that. That's there's ijma, consensus of the ummah that this is what aqimu salah means. So, certain groups that call themselves botan, bot, botanis, that they they attempted to. They claimed to find meaning in that ayah, inside the ayah, to replace the outward meaning. So they would say, aqimu salah, it's basically just an injunction of remembering Allah in your heart, and so therefore you don't have to pray. Okay, that type of inward tafsir is, leads to kufr. That type of inward tafsir is heretical. It's completely rejected by our tradition. So that's not what the ishara is of the people of spirituality. The ishara of the people of spirituality never replaces the standard outward tafsir. The ishara would affirm the standard tafsir. Aqimu salah is to establish the five prayers. But in addition to that, isn't it interesting to note, dot, 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 that the ishara is a meaning that comes to the mind or the heart of a person on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they can notice a benefit of, that a benefit in that does not replace the outward tafsir. So for example, two of the main texts that I will be using for our conversations. One of them is Al-Bahr al-Madid li Ibn Ajiba, the vast ocean of Ibn Ajiba. Ibn Ajiba, is, he's a Moroccan scholar and uh, mystic who died 1224 in the Hijri calendar, uh, so about 200 years ago. And his Bahr al-Madid, this tafsir, he, he clearly delineates tafsir versus ishara. He has a section for every group of ayat. He has a section called tafsir which is the standard exegesis of the ulama of Islam on those ayahs. And in fact, he did a great service in that, in the tafsir portion of his Bahr al-Madid because he takes the 
conversations of the of the Mufassirin in the history of Islam, starting his point of departure is Baydawi's tafsir. Uh, Alama Baydawi's tafsir is the most standard tafsir that's taught in the Sunni tradition. And to this day, in the Ottoman lands, in India, Pakistan, the different lands where Sunni Islam has a strong tradition of isnad, the tafsir that's taught is Alama Baydawi's tafsir. This is a standard tafsir that's that's taught. So, but Alama Baydawi's tafsir, if anyone has experience with it, it's it's very uh, scholarly, in the sense that he doesn't just give the standard, the 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 the, the you know the meaning, a summarized presentation of the meanings of the ayat, he goes into grammatical possibilities, tangential discussions of, you know, ikhtilaf uh, amongst the ulama as to what these ayats could mean, but then he'll, but it's still succinct, he, he you know, he tries to give a, a, a summation, but there's that tangential aspect for the s student and scholar that's studying that tafsir. So what Ibn Ajiba did as a great service is to, he takes the upshot of Baydawi. He takes the upshot of Baydawi without the tangential discussions, without the grammatical investigations, and he just gives the basic standard Sunni interpretation of the ayat. And I, and I emphasize Sunni because what Alama Baydawi did, he really took Zamakhshari as a starting point. Zamakhshari's Kashaf, which was the agreed, you know, as a tafsir, it was one of the most excellent tafsir of the, in the history of Islam, but Imam Zamakhshari was Mu'tazili. And so it had its i'tizal, it had its points of, of uh, aqidah that contradicted the Sunni uh, aqidah. So what Alama Baydawi did is that he took the tafsir of Zamakhshari, but then he, he's an Ashari, so he, he did it in the framework of the Ashari creed, of the of Sunni theology. So uh, what Ibn Ajiba did as a great service is he really gives the upshot of Baydawi. Okay, he gives the upshot of Baydawi in his tafsir section. After that, he clear, clearly mar demarcates a separate conversation called ishara. And in that ishara, then he just, the meanings that have occurred uh, upon the hearts of people close to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that uh, what, what they noted and, and what type of benefits they found in the words of the Quran for a person journey, journeying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a separate genre than tafsir proper. So, my main focus with the Bahr al-Madid will be the tafsir section, the first half, inshallah. If there's a little bit from the ishara we can take from, then we'll, we'll try to do that. But we're, we wanted to do it because it's just a very uh, easy way to access. You know, it's really a culmination of, of centuries of conversations that stemmed from Baydawi's, uh, his, his tafsir. And then the second one that, inshallah, I use at times is Imam Qushayri's Lata'if al-Isharat. So Imam Qushayri, who dies 465 Hijri, he, uh, his is a work of isharat. He called it the subtleties of, of isharat. So it's sort of like eth ethical lessons that we can take, you know, spiritual and ethical les lessons that we can take from, from the uh, stories of Surat al-Kahf, from the, from the ayat. But it, again, it never replaces the outward tafsir. This is the key thing we wanted to emphasize so no one gets confused uh, about, about this. So for example, with the Basmala, Imam Qushayri says, Rahimullah, Sama'u bismillah rahatul qulub wa diya'uha wa shifa'ul arwah wa dawa'uha. He says, just to hear bismillah, you know, listening to the sound of bismillah is a comfort for the hearts and an illumination for the hearts. And it's a cure for the souls and it's, it, it's a cure and medicine for the souls. So, you know, again, tying it back to what we mentioned last week, that what the ulama have commented about the basmala is that really it's emphasizing our need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that nothing exists except bismillah. That's, that's a, it's a statement of reality. And then ethically, are, are we people that embrace that reality? And, and so if we embrace our need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go to Allah in need of Him, this, it'll be a comfort for the heart. It'll be a cure for the heart. It'll be a, just because he's saying even listening to Bismillah, right? Because it reminds the heart of this ontological reality that we only exist Bismillah with the name of Allah through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, maintaining us, that this is the only basis of our existence. And so the heart, when the heart and the soul is reminded of this reality, it, it's curative, it's therapeutic. It gives a, a, a type of raha, a type of, you know, because the anxiety comes when we try to claim rububiyah, 
All of the anxieties come when we try to claim lordship, and we do that in very subtle ways. Even the claim of independence, you know, kalla inna al-insana la yatqa ar-ra'ahu staghna. Allah Taala says in Surah uh, uh, Al-Alaq that verily, no, verily, the human being has has far outstepped the bounds, has far outstepped the bounds that Allah has set for him. How ar-ra'ahu staghna? When he thinks he's independent when he thinks he's free of need. He thinks himself as in and of himself having some sort of merit, in and of himself having some sort of autonomy. Whereas going back to the basmalah, bismillah, it's only because of Allah that I'm here. It's only because of Allah that I have any, any merit. And so, and this also connects to the story of the people of the cave. Because the people of the cave, they embrace that need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they sacrifice everything and go to the cave, they're expressing their need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the dua that they make, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma wa hayyit lana min amrina rashada in ayah uh, 10 of, of the surah, which we'll get to, inshallah, that this is an expression of their need. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma. Our Lord, grant us mercy from your presence directly. Wa hayyit lana min amrina rashada. And for our, this affair of ours, Give it a hay'ah, give it a form of, of guidance. Give it a form of guidance. You know, from, through that form, the mercy comes through. So expressing their need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not take, you know, it's, it's because of, look at our sacrifice, look at our ability to give up everything. No, they're begging Allah. And so this connects to the basmala. In fact, the very ba of the basmala does that. So, uh, and then the shukr. Imam Qushayri says that إِذَا حُمِلَ الْحَمْدُ هُنَا عَلَى مَعْنَ الشُّكْرِ فَإِنزَالُ الْكِتَابِ مِنْ أَجَلِّ نِعَمَهِ So Allah Ta'ala mentions in this first ayah Alhamdulillah الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَى عَبْدِهِ الْكِتَابِ So conjoining the praise of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala with the sending of the book. Okay, and so he refers to this. He says that if the hamd, if the praise here, if it's interpreted to mean gratitude, Shukr lillah, a shukr lillah. Gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the sending down of the book, min ajalli ni'amahi, is from the most magnificent and sublime of Allah's blessings. Wa kitabul habib lada al habib ajallu mawqi'in wa ashrafu mahallin. And the, and the book from a, from a lover, from a beloved to the beloved is the greatest station and the most honorable place that this is ultimately Firstly, a book from Allah to the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so it's 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 ultimately a book of love, because the relationship between Allah and the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is at the, at the heart of the relationship is love. So every of the supreme prophets, they have unique titles. Nuh alayhi salam is Najiullah, the one that Allah saved. Musa alayhi salam is Kalimullah, the one that Allah spoke to. Isa alayhi salam is Ruh Allah, the special spirit created by God without any intermediary of parent, the normal parental relationship. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam is Khalilullah, the beloved intimate friend, the intimate, intimate friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Khalil comes from Khalala, you know, to be intertwined. So it's as if the, the Khalil in, in, amongst creatures are two people, their hearts are like locked. They're so close, They're the, the, the highest level of friendship. This is Ibrahim alayhi salam. But what's the title of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam? It's Habibullah. Right, this is his title. He's the beloved of God. And so we have to see then the inzalul kitab, the sending down of the book in the, in, from this understanding or paradigm of love. That it's, it's a book of love between Allah and the Prophet And so if we embrace the book now, we become those that receive that love. We, be, we, we enter into the sphere of Allah's love for his Prophet, specifically that, that love. If we can embrace the book, we enter the sphere of Allah's love for His Prophet ﷺ. It extends to us. It extends to us. So this is this is sublime, and and so Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب. Praise be to Allah who sent down upon His servant this book, this chance for us to be part of this love, this opportunity for us to be part of this love. And so, how do we do it now? How how do we also become? How do we enter that sphere? You know, how do we embrace that book? It's, it's found in this ayah as well, ala abdihi, ala abdihi. So this is also telling us, apprising us of the path that we need to take of embracing the book. How do we embrace the book? Ubudiyya. 
is real servanthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How, this is how we now enter the sphere because the, the book came down on Abdul, Abdihi, the servant, his, capital H, servant. That's who the beloved is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if we can also become Abdihi, then the, the, the book, which with all of that love, enters into our lives. We, we reflect the book. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His character was the Qur'an. And so then we need to contemplate ubudiyah. What exactly is servanthood? Some of the masters have given us descriptions of servanthood. One of them said, al ubudiyatu al qiyamu bi haqq ta'at bi shart al tawqir wa nadru ila ma minka bi ayn al taqsir wa wal wa shuhud ma yahsulu min manaqibika min al taqdir. That three three aspects of ubudiyah, three aspects of genuine servanthood. Uh, that we can embrace if we want to also be servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Qiyam bi haqq al-ta'at bi shart al-tawqir is to fulfill the rights of Allah's obligations, to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's obligations with the condition of veneration, with the condition of veneration that not only just, alhamdulillah, got done with another salat, back to dunya, and get serious with what, where my heart really lies, right? No. Alhamdulillah, I got done with dunya, back to salat, where my heart really lies. And so looking at, it's a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift, looking at obedience to Allah as our real professions. Looking at obedience of Allah as our real, you know, we like to think of ourselves through our resumes. You know, this is my accomplishment, this is my achievement, this is the path I took, this is the degrees I got, this is the check, 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 and this defines who I am. And this is just dunya. This is just dunya. This is the, Allah Ta'ala mentions it in the coming ayahs that, you know, he, he adorned. This is the adornment. You know, it's just glitter on the earth. The reality of the Abdullah, the reality of, a, of God's servant is that that's all on the side. That's just extra. That's like a, that's just the rasm. We talked about rasm and haqiqah last week. That's just the form. The reality is Allah's worship, the reality that I want to embrace. This is the attitude of the believer. Al Qiyam bi haqq al ta'at bi shart al tawqir is to embrace and, and fulfill the rights of obedience with the, with the condition of veneration. Like, this is what defines my reality is that I will embrace the prayer regularly, I will embrace the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly, I will embrace the recital of the Quran regularly with veneration. You know, and veneration is the touchstone. Veneration is the key. Ven veneration will transform a person's life. Just having ta'lim in the heart, tawqir in the heart of, of Allah and His rights. That is whoever venerates the symbols of Allah, even the symbols, let alone Allah Himself. That's from the taqwa of the hearts. That's from God consciousness in the hearts, taking God seriously. You know, a beautiful example of this is the story of Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi ibn al-Harith, he was a contemporary of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in Iraq in the third century of Islam. And he was, a, he was someone who was just Adi, a normal Muslim, not, not, a, not a spiritual n notable in any way. And until he made his tawbah, until he decided to take Allah seriously and live accordingly. So what was the cause of his tawbah? What, what sparked him to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That he was walking one day on the road and he sees on the floor a piece of paper with Allah's name on it that had been stepped on by many people. And so this affected him. This is the, the, he, he felt that this is, the, where's the veneration? Where's the, where's the respect of Allah's name? And so he picks it up and he dusts it off and he had just a little bit of money with him and so he goes to the perfume shop and he buys a little pouch of perfume. And he goes home and he, he cleans it and he takes the perfume and he perfumes the, the paper. And then before he goes to bed that night, he puts it up in the niche of his wall at home to elevate it, perfumed and elevated. And then he goes to bed. And that night he has a dream and in the dream he hears a voice and the voice says to him, Ya Bishr, Tayyabta ismi. O Bishr, you perfumed my name. La utayyibanna ismaka fid dunya wal akhirah. 
I shall perfume your name in this life and the next. I shall perfume your name in, the, in this life and the next. And he becomes Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi is one of, the, one of the greatest, greatest, greatest names in our spiritual tradition ever. Imam Ahmad used to respect him so much. He, he, his whole life changed. But look at the basis. What, what sparked that is veneration. The, the, what sparked it is just you know, respecting Allah, respecting Allah's name. If, that, if that's the attitude towards the symbol of Allah, what is his attitude towards Allah himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, and what, 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 what level did Bishr reach? You know, he later, after many years of directing himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has another dream. And in this dream, the Prophet comes to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and the Prophet says to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Bishr, uh, atadri lima rafa'akallahu min bayni aqranik. He says, Oh Bishr, do you know why Allah raised you from amongst your contemporaries? Why Allah made you so special amongst your contemporaries? He says, La ya Rasulullah, no, O God's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, Bittiba'ika li sunnati, you know, because of how diligently you followed my sunnah. Wa, uh, wa khidmatika li salihin, and your service to the righteous, and your service to the righteous. Wa nasihata li ikhwanik, and your genuine concern for your brothers. Your genuine concern for your brothers, no envy, no selfishness, genuine wanting your brothers to do well. Wa mahabbatik li ahli, li ahli bayti wa ashabi, and your love for my family and my companions. Thalika alladhi balaghaka manazil al abrar. That is what made you reach the stations of the righteous. That is what made you reach the stations of the righteous. Right, right. But it all began with what? With veneration, with deep veneration, you know. So, so this is Ubudiya. This is Ubudiya. Then, there's another story of Bishr, I can't help it. So, real quickly, later on, after he passed away, Rahimullah, uh, one of the one of the righteous was walking on the road, and he, he Imam Qushayri relates this in his risala. He's walking on the road, and uh, a man suddenly is next to him. He was alone, and suddenly a man starts walking with him on the road. And this person, he says, it dawned on my heart that this is that this is al Khidr alayhi salam. This is and who who's mentioned referred to in Surah Kahf, so it's appropriate, inshallah. And this is also this is you know. Uh, many, many ulama had narrations where they met Khidr salam, that he's one of the people that Allah gave life until the end of time, according to many, many narrations. And in fact, Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, the great Amir al-Mu'mineen fil hadith, the great master of hadith, in his book Al-Isaba, his compendium of companions of the Prophet wasallam, he has an entry for Sayyidina Khidr salam. As a hadith scholar, he has an entry for Khidr al Islam as a companion because there's, there's narrations, even though they're weak, they still together, there's something there of substance that he felt it's, he, he put an entry that Khidr al Islam is considered a companion. So he has this, he has been given life until the end of time. So this man is walking on the road, he says, It dawned on my heart, this is Khidr al Islam. So he said, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. He says, Hal anta Khidr, are you Khidr? He says, Nam. Uh, no, he, he says, Man anta, who are you? He says, Akhuk al Khidr. He says, your brother Khidr. He says, Halli an asal, you know, can I ask you some questions? He says, Hat, yani, sal, ma, you know, ask your questions. He says, Mada taqul fi shafi'i. What do you say about Imam Shafi'i? This is years later after he had passed away. And he says, Kana min al Otad. He was of the, of the highest tier of awliya, the Otad. And the Otad are like the pegs of the tent. There's, there's like, it's a, it's a rank uh, of four special, special people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, ماذا تقول في أحمد بن حنبل? What do you say about Ahmad ibn Hanbal? And he says, رجل Siddiq, A man of, like Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Siddiq, someone who, who has genuine certainty, faith, unwavering faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, a, the highest rank of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, ماذا تقول في بشر الحافي? The one we were sp speaking about. What do you say about Bishr al-Hafi? And the response comes, 
لم يخلق من بعد لم يخلق مثله بعد the likes of him have not been created since him the likes of him have not been created since him those are his three questions and then he concludes he says um, uh, what was the thing that enabled me to meet you you know what was my deed that enabled me to meet you and he says birruka li ummik how good you were to your mother how good you were to your mother no so this is all from from Ubudiya. so this is the first that that having this veneration and then the second he said when nadri la ma minka bi ayn taqsir seeing whatever comes from you with the eye of falling short seeing whatever comes from you from the eye of falling short this is from obadiya any time we 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 uh, feel that what we've done is worthy of anything we're we're lacking obadiya okay any time we you know so that something that we do something that we've achieved and we have a sense of pride in it this is contrary to obadiya servanthood to allah entails that we always find it as lacking we always see that it could be improved and then the third one was shuhud ma yahsul min manaqibaka min at taqdir to witness whatever achievements you have as from the divine decree to witness all of your achievements as from the divine decree that it's just destiny unfolding you had this great great success you have this great great resume you have this great great achievement you you have the most prestige amongst your peers etc it's just the decree it's nothing about myself this is from from Ubudiya. So uh, embracing these, these realities. So going back to then what Imam Qushari says, he says, he says, وَإِذَا حُمِلَ الْحَمْدُ فِي هَذِي الْآيَةَ عَلَى مَعْنَ الْمَدْحِ If hamd, however, in this verse is interpreted to mean praise rather than shukr, كان الأمر فيه بمعنى الثناء عليه. What it means then is Allah glorifying Himself, Subhanahu, بأنه الملك that He is the King الذي له الأمر والنهي والحكم بما يريد, who possesses the command, the prohibition, and the de determination of everything He wills. Allah is glorifying Himself that He is the King who has the command, the prohibition, and the determination of everything that He wills. وأنه عد الأحكام التي في هذا الكتاب للعبيد, and that He is prepared the rulings that are in this book for his abid. He has prepared the rulings that are in this book for his abid. وَسَمَّاهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَبْدَهُ لَمَّا كَانَ فَانِيًا عَنْ حُدُودِهِ خَالِصًا لِلَّهِ بِقِيَامِهِ بِحُقُوقِهِ And that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, has named his Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم عَبْدَهُ, his servant, because, and now he mentions two traits, <coughs> so we can add to our understanding of Ubudiyya. Because if he was fani an hududihi, he was completely absent from his personal interests. The Prophet ﷺ was completely absent from his own personal interests. His interests were Allah's interests. His goals were Allah's goals. And this is why part of Ubudiya is directing our hum to Allah. The hum is a person's main concern. You know, the hum is someone's concern. The, the human tendency is that the humum are scattered. All of our concerns are scattered. We're concerned about this particular, concerned about this particular, concerned about this particular. And the hajat, the needs are multiplying and multiplying and the stresses and the anxieties. And it's just variegated, variegated. And as each day and night passes, it becomes more and more separated, separated. And it's, it's the lack of unity. Ultimately, the separation is the opposite. Multiplicity is the opposite of unity. The goal of the believer is to unify his hum. The goal of the mu'min is to unify his hum. How do we unify our hum? How do we unify our main concern? Our, where, we, where, where, we're, where, are, where we place our stress and anxiety? Is that we, it's, it's from tawheed. It's from tawheed. Make Allah our sole concern. Make Allah himself our sole concern. And this is why the masters have said, man, man, man ja'ala hammahu hamman wahidan. Whoever makes his sole concern one, whoever unifies his concern, Allah will then suffice those other concerns. If you make your one directedness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then those things will ta be taken care of on their own. And, and yeah, we have to go through the motions of solving our problems, but it's just motions then. There's no, there's no burden on the heart. If we feel a burden on the heart, it's because we're a bit scattered in our consciousness. 
if we can unify our consciousness to Allah alone, then inshallah, the, all of these scattered stresses will become lighter and they'll start, things will click, inshallah. Things will click in a, in a, in a there will be a flow of life, inshallah. And this is what we, so we have to direct, this is why Ibn Atala says that, you know, that relate, because related to hum is himma. Related to hum is himma in Arabic. And there's a, there's a deep metaphysics in the roots of Arabic. So hum is one's concern, one's anxiety and concern, what they're, what they're, what they're really concerned about, directed towards. The, uh, well, concerned about. The himma is what you're directed towards. The himma is your aspiration. The himma is your zeal and enthusiasm, what moves you. So whatever a person's hum is, his himma will be directed that, that way. If your hum is a particular, if your concern is something, your anxiety is about something, then your himma, your zeal and enthusiasm will be directed towards solving that thing. We are weak creatures. If we're too scattered, we only have so much himma to give everything. And we'll find that it all kind of falls. So if we can unify our hum, then we will unify our himma. If we can unify our concern, we'll unify our energy. And if we unify our energy towards Allah, then He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, ala kulli shayin qadir, He will take care of all of these other things. So Ibn Atayla, in this light, he says, لا تتعدى نيتو همتك إلى غيره You know, don't let the, the intention of your himma go past Allah. Don't let the intention of your himma go beyond Allah. فالكريم لا تتخطاه الأمال Because the truly generous one Hopes cannot step past him. Because the truly generous one, hopes cannot step past him. This word, this is the same word, you know, khutwa, like in the Juma, you know, if it's really packed, then you're not supposed to tahatta riqab, you know, you're not supposed to step over people to get to the front row. If it's you're, you just sit wherever you find space, you don't walk over people in the Juma. That's prohibited in the according to the Sunnah. It's, some, it's bad etiquette. So, so he's using this word. He says that you know why should your the niya the intention of your himma why should it why should you not let it go past Allah Himself? Because the generous one, Al Karim, Allah Taala, Al Amal la tatakhtahu. You know, hopes cannot step past Allah. Hopes cannot step past Allah because He's Al Karim. You won't find any karam other than with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no generosity except him. So direct all of our hopes in Al-Kareem. Don't let them go. Don't, don't say, okay, I have this on my list, this on my list, this on my list. Then there's Allah's rights, and then there's this, and there's this. And every day I check them off. I got this done, I got this done, I got this done. Did my prayers, got this done. No, make our, make our genuine love and concern and hearts fall, you know, go into... Allah and his ahkam, the, the kitab, the book that he has sent down. Let this be our life focus. And then inshallah, Allah will suffice us. You know, alaysa Allahu kafin abda. This is Allah Ta'ala says, alaysa Allahu kafin abda. It's a beautiful question. Is Allah not sufficient for his servant? Is Allah not sufficient for his, his genuine servant? The people, again, ubudiyah, this meaning that we're talking about. So, that, that Allah Ta'ala has named his Prophet وسلم, in this verse, Abdahu, his special servant. Because why? He was fanian and hudhi. He was absent from his own personal interests, personal concerns. Khalisan lillahi bi qiyamihi bi You know, pure for Allah in fulfilling Allah's rights. Pure for Allah in fulfilling Allah's rights. So this is, this is what we should embrace. And and again, it goes back to the kitab. Because now, look, what does the ayah say? What is this kitab? Allah Ta'ala now describes this kitab. He has not placed therein any crookedness. Iwaj is, is to be bent. Right? So Allah has not placed in the book any crookedness because it's, it's perfect. Everything in the book of Allah is perfect. And every prescription in the book of Allah is perfect for us. And that's the only way we can have perfection. Qayyima, the second ayah starts, fully, you know, upright, fully upright, balanced. Qayyima, fully upright, balanced. So again, we need to reflect that. Do we have iwaj in us? 
Do we have crookedness in us or are we balanced and upright? Say, I believe in Allah and then be upright. Be steady, be steadfast, be balanced. How can you be upright and, and not waver this way and that way? If you start wavering right and left, it's all cro crookedness. It's bent. You're bending yourself. How do you just stay directed? Is through the kitab. Is making our soul concern Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is now, so then this is, this is using Allah's hukum as a gauge of, of our own selves. This is the goal, Make, developing a Quranic consciousness such that when we examine ourselves, we're looking at, at ourselves through the lens of the Quran. When we look at the world, we look at it through the lens of the Quran. The kitab is our mizan because it's qayyim. It's, it's perfectly balanced. And so it's the best gauge to use to judge anything else. Anything, any other gauge will be, it will have awaj, it will have cro crookedness. So it won't give you an accurate depiction of yourself or the world. Like right now we're inundated with the most crooked ways of seeing ourselves. You know, even the, the balance of gender is being questioned and, 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 and ripped. The fabric of that balance is being ripped by the, by, by the public ethos. And, and, and all, so all of these virtues that have been, that are timeless, you know, from all of the, the faith traditions, let alone the, the final manifestation of truth that abrogates all of their previous dispensations, this, these are being challenged. So we have to be very straight and strong in this, in this time especially. So, so on that light, you know, the Abu Hafs al-Haddad, Abu Hafs al-Haddad, he was from Nisapur, he died in the year 260. He has a statement, he says that مَنْ لَمْ يَزِنْ أَفْعَالُهُ وَأَحْوَالُهُ فِي كُلِّ وَقْتِ بِالْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ Whoever does not measure his actions and his states, whoever does not measure his actions and his states, فِي كُلِّ وَقْتِ in every time, بِالْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ based on the book and the sunnah, وَلَمْ يَتَّهِمْ خَوَاطِرَهُ and who is not suspicious of his thoughts, who does not keep, who does not suspicious of his thoughts, always looking, examining the thoughts, are these, are, these, are these in correspondence with Allah's pleasure or not? Are these in correspondence with Allah's pleasure or not? فَلَا نَعِدْهُ فِي دِيوَانِ الرِّجَالِ He says, then we don't count him in the uh, diwan, in the register of the rijal. And the rijal in this, term, this terminology of rijal means the spiritually adept. Right? It's not a gender thing, but it's the spiritually adept, the masters. Whoever does not weigh his actions and his states in every moment with the book and the sunnah and who is not suspicious of his thoughts, we, we do not count him in the register of the masters. So if we want to be masters, people who are really you know, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, masters of the, 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 the prophetic way, then this is the criterion that we have to have. So, Qayyima, upright, balanced, liyundir. The lamb here, whenever the lamb is used <clears throat> with respect to Allah's actions, that's normally translated to in order to, what's called the lamb of ta'lil the lamb of in order to, that Allah Ta'ala does something li, so that, or for, in order to, then according to the uh, Asharis and Maturidis, because af'alullah la tu'allal, Allah's actions are never uh, based on motives. Allah's actions are never based on motives. So whenever this type of lamb occurs, it has to be translated as uh, with the consequence of, with the consequence of. So we don't say, for example, that Allah sent down the book in order to warn. Allah sent down the book in order to warn. Because that, in terms of theology, that would mean that Allah's actions were based on a motive. And Allah knew the motive, the, the, the end result that, that he was seeking, and that moved him to act in a certain way. But Allah's actions are not bound by motives because Allah is the one who determines the consequences of every act. 
Allah simply selects action and consequence, action and consequence, and He creates them both, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So He's not moved the way human, because mukhalifa lil hawadith, one of the necessary attributes of God, He differs from His creation. So we, we're moved by things. So someone is thirsty, that's a, mo that's a motivation. It mo moves him to act and drink the water. Someone is hungry, that moves him to act. So he, he drank the water in order to quench his thirst. Now we use ta'lil for human beings. But for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't use ta'lil. So these lambs we translate with the consequence of, that this is a determined consequence that Allah himself selected subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's the consequence of sending down this upright book? Liyundir, that he may warn but shadidan of a painful torment, milladunhu from his presence, wa yubashir al mu'minin and to give glad tidings to the believers, aladina yamaluna salihat, those that work righteously, anna lahum ajran hasana. That what's the bushra, the glad tidings that they shall have a beauteous, beautiful reward, makithina fihi abada. They shall dwell therein forever, indicating that the ajr is paradise, because dwelling in the reward, the abode of of reward is paradise, and it's perpetual. This is something of our aqidah. Both Jannah and Nar are forever. Both Jannah and Nar, paradise and hell, are forever. And uh, for sometimes this poses a problem for people reconciling a temporary life with an eternal recompense. And Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, addresses this in the Ihyan al Medin, in which he says that one of the wisdoms of this is based on intentions based on intentions. So the intention of the believer is such that if Allah Ta'ala extended his life forever, he would continue to have iman. He would continue to affirm Allah's oneness. And the intention of the rejecter of faith is that so long as Allah gives him life, he would intend to reject Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So his intention is forever and therefore the recompense is forever. So it's based on intentions. Al-amal bil-niyat. The actions are by their intentions. Wal-amal bil khawatim So this is uh, one explanation of the perpetuity of the, uh, uh, of the afterlife. Naam. So then now what is this uh, for the ba' shadid or for qayyima, Imam Qushayri comments, qayyima, he says, Upright balance, a sanahu min ta'arud wa tanaqud. Allah has preserved the book from contradiction or discrepancy. Allah has preserved the book from any contradiction, contradiction or discrepancy. So for over 1400 years now, the Quran has laid a challenge for all of humanity. Is that if you reject this book, then produce the like of it. Produce the like of it of even a short surah. And humanity has been incapable. It's a mu'jizah, it has incapacitated people from replicating the like of it. And so this is, this is of the miracles of the Qur'an, is it's, is it's, uh, it's qayyim, it is pre preserved from any discrepancy or contradiction. فَهُوَ كِتَابٌ aziz مِنْ رَبٍّ aziz. So it is a great, great book from a great, great Lord. Right? This is a special book from a special Lord. And also that sending down the book is Allah's tarbiyah of us. Allah sent down the book, it's from his tarbiyah, it's his manifestation as Rabb. Well, but shadid, the painful torment, the intense torment, he's, Imam Qushayri says, Mu'ajjaluhu al-firaq wa mu'ajjaluhu al-ihtiraq. He says the immediate torment is to be distant from Allah. So the people who reject Allah have godless lives. And the people, and, the, and, and even the believer who's not directing himself to Allah is, has a life where they're not experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just becomes, you know, a principle they've believed in, and, and, or not a principle, but, but a, a tenet of faith. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his reality are, is but a tenet of faith, I, I believe this and I'm certain of it because there's proofs of it. The, the, the world indicates Allah the creator of the world, so I believe in the creator of the world, I believe in our Prophet Wasallam. but it's still, it's a distant thing. It's a distant thing, so there's a distance there. So that's part of, that's a manifestation of the but shadid in this life for even someone. So there's levels of this. The but shadid in this life is firaq, is distance from Allah. For the person who rejects truth altogether, they understand truth and they reject it, what's called kafir, then that person has a godless life. 
Okay, they don't believe in God and they don't see God at all. For the, for the believer who believes God, then alhamdulillah, they have salvation. They have salvation if they die on that. And they have some connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's profoundly greater than obviously the lack of connection at all. But if they're not directing their hearts to Allah, directing their lives to Allah, then Allah is a distant reality for them. Even though Allah says, Allah never calls himself distant in the Quran. He's not ba'id. Allah Ta'ala says, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ If my servants ask you about me, then verily I am near. So Allah's reality is near to us. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ He is with you wherever you are. There's not three people except Allah is the fourth. There's not five people except Allah is the sixth. Right? So this is from the Quran as well. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very aqrabu ilayhi min habril warid, closer to him than his very life, than his very life, the life jugular vein, the, the, the basis of human life biologically, Allah is closer to us than our very life. Wallah Verily Allah intervenes between a person and his own consciousness. Verily Surah Al Anfal, verily Allah intervenes. between a person and his own consciousness, like your own recognition of your own existence. Between you and that is Allah. How near is Allah? How near is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But are we perceiving this? Are we, so the, if it, the, le, the less that we perceive this, that's a part of the punishment, according to Imam Qush. The but shadid has different levels. We ask Allah to manifest his closeness with lutf. And then mu'ajjaluhu al-ihtiraq, the, the, the the, the long-term punishment is, of course, the burning of hell itself. Allah majirna min nar And so then, wa yubashir al mu'minin al-ladina ya'maluna salihat, and 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 that the consequence of sending on the book is giving glad tidings to believers who work righteous deeds. He's, Imam Qushayri says, wal amru salih ma yasluhu lil qabul. What's a righteous deed? Saluha comes from to be suitable for. Saluha comes, to, comes from the root to be suitable for. It's salih, it's suitable, it's commensurate, it's appropriate. So the amal salih, the deed that's appropriate, is ma yasluh lil qabul, is what is appropriate for Allah Ta'ala to accept it. What's appropriate for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to accept it. What is, how does a, a, a spiritual work become appropriate for acceptance is when we don't notice it. Okay, how does a spiritual work become appropriate for Allah to ex Allah's acceptance of it is when we don't give it much weight, when we don't notice it. So if we, if we are you know, reminiscing about the one time when I finished two juz in a day and then I continued every day for a good month or, the one, or how I, I give so many hundred salawat a day or how I'm able to do this every day or how I'm able to do that every day and mashallah anni and if, the, if we're thinking about, if we were still able to remember vividly our good deeds, that's a bad sign that it, it didn't get accepted. Because when a good deed gets accepted, وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ Allah Ta'ala says, وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ The good deed, the deed that's suitable for acceptance, Allah raises it. It's in the Quran, Allah raises it. And so if it's still on earth, as it were, in our minds, and us impressed with ourselves, maybe it hasn't been raised. It's very scary. But if we don't really re re recollect the good that we've done, it's like, alhamdulillah, anything good, it was Allah's tawfiq, but man, I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm at zero right now, right? I'm at zero. I, need, I have so much to do, subhanAllah. I haven't started. I haven't started. I've done nothing for Allah. Then inshallah, that's a sign that it was all raised. We're not, we're not holding on to it in our minds. So don't take any ownership. Don't take any ownership. Any good deed, it was Allah's creation. Allah created it, gifted it to you. You know, Abu Suleiman Darani says, كَيْفَ يُعْجِبُ الْعَبْدِ كَيْفَ يُعْجِبُ الْمَرْءُ عَنْ عَمْلِهِ وَإِنَّمَا عَمْلُهُ عَطِيَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةٌ مِّنْهُ عَلَيْهِ شُكْرُهَا He says, how, how in the world can a person be impressed with his spiritual works? How in the world could a, a person ever be impressed with a, a, a spiritual work that he did? His, his works are but a gift from Allah and a blessing from Allah that he should be grateful for. Alayhi shukruha. Naam. So, ma yaslahu lil qabul. 
And, and so then he continues, وَهُوَ مَا يُؤَدَّى عَلَى الْوَجْءَ الَّذِي أُمِرَ بِهِ وَيُقَالْ الْعَمُلُ الصَّالِحِ مَا كَانَ بِنَعْتِ الْخُلُوسِ وَصَاحِبُهُ صَادِقٌ فِيهِ He gives different, different ways of understanding what is a work suitable for acceptance. That it is something that was performed in the manner that Allah commanded it. And, and it's also said that a, that a work that's righteous is what is done with the, with the attribute of purity of intention and that it's it's per, the one that uh, did the work was genuine in it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yuqal huwa alladhi la yasta'jal alayhi sahibu haddan fi dunya min akhdhi iwadin aw qabuli jahin aw in in iqadi riyasatin and it's also said that a righteous work is that which the one who did it does not try to receive a benefit because of it in this life so expecting some sort of recompense in this life or using it as a means of becoming notable or gaining some sort of leadership. Okay, so when, when, our, when our deeds for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are connected in our minds with these aims, these worldly aims of being noted for being pious, being noted for being holy, oh, people will think I'm a wali, people will think I'm this, this is a sign that it's not a righteous act, it wasn't accepted, wali billah. Naam. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَيُنذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدَى Ayah 4, and also with the consequence that Allah warns specifically those people that said, Allah took a son. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمِ They have no, nothing of knowledge. The min there is za'ida. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمِ Ilm is a mubtada, it's a subject of this sentence, but the min that makes it majroor is extra for emphasis. مِنْ za'ida lil mubalagha. So, they have nothing of knowledge of this. There's zero, nothing of knowledge. Walali abahim, abaihim, nor of their forefathers. Kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afwahihim. How enormous it is as a statement. Kalimatan here in the grammar is the tamiz. Kaburat kalimatan. And the indefinite is often used for ta'deem, for something huge. And so kaburat, what an enormous, what an enormous, how enormous it is, kalimatan, as a word, as a statement. Takhruju min afwahihim. Look, Allah Ta'ala describing literally the, 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 the details of speech. You know, Allah Ta'ala says how enormous it is, kaburat, kalimatan, a word, a statement, takhruju min afwahihim that just comes out of their mouths. Like giving it no way, you know, God has a son, just comes out. Allah Ta'ala says that the heavens and earth almost explode because of what is said that God has a son. God has a child, excuse me. This is, uh, it's not gender specific. The, the Qurayshi uh, Arabs that said Allah, the Malaika are the daughters of Allah, this still applies. Anyone that attributes partnership to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, this would apply. So, They say not except a lie. The in here is negating. They say nothing but a lie. Absolute lie. Now, alhamdulillah, we're all, inshallah, free from the obvious shirk of associating partners with Allah. Alhamdulillah, shukrillah. But there's a lesson for us here. There's a lesson for us here. So look what... Look what uh, Imam Qushayri says. He says, فَتُّهَمَ الْقَبِيحَةُ نَتِيجَةُ جَهْلِهِمْ So their vile accusations are but a result of their ignorance. بِوَحْدَانِيَةِ اللَّهِ their, their vile accusations are the consequence of their ignorance of Allah's oneness. So, ignorance of Allah's oneness leads to gross accusations of Allah. Ignorance of Allah's oneness leads to gross accusations upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, alhamdulillah, we understand the clear outward shirk of idolatry assigning partnership to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Muslim is preserved from that, alhamdulillah. And because of that preservation has eternal paradise, inshallah. This is alhamdulillah our, our, our aqidah. But within our aqidah, we, we are tawheed our monotheism of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, what's called radical. Okay, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Muslims assert 
is very radical. Okay, and the obvious example is what's called the uh, hukm al-adi. The hukm al-adi. So when we make a distinction between the hukm aqli and the hukm adi, a rational law and a physical law. Okay, that the physical laws are not rationally necessary. This is the, from the Sunni Aqidah that what we perceive as causation in the world is merely the way Allah creates things, right? We, someone lights a fire, it burns the object that it touches. We don't say that the fire creates the burning. We say Allah creates the fire and Allah creates the burning and Allah creates the meeting of the two. Someone drinks water and it quenches their thirst. We don't say the water created, like the cause in our understanding is creation. To cause something is to create it. And so we don't say that it's a real cause. It's just the sabab, it's the, it's the way Allah has paired things in the world. So what, when the person drinks water, the effect that they perceive that their, that their, their thirst has been quenched, that's attributed to Allah. It's not attributed to the water. The water is simply the sabab, it's simply the means in which Allah creates his effect. It's not even through which. We don't say Allah created it through the water. We say Allah created it with the water. When the water is paired with the person drinking, Allah creates the quenching of the thirst. When the food is paired with the person's eating, Allah creates the satiation of the body. When the fire is paired with the touching of the object, Allah creates the burning. This is the Tawheed of Islam. This is the Tawheed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Sunni orthodoxy perspective of monotheism is very radical. And this is reflected in our, our, the Quran and Sunnah itself. Allah Ta'ala says many times, in three times in the Quran, Khaliqu kulli shay, the creator of every single thing. Allah Ta'ala says, Wa huwa al-khalaqu al-alim. He is the khalaq. This is an emphatic way of emphasizing his, his, his creative fiat, that he, it's his creation. There's nothing that he wills except that he says, kun fayakun. He says kun. The water can't say kun. The water doesn't say be, and there's the, there's, the thir- there's the quenching of the thirst. The fire can't say be, and then the... No, all of it is attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ Have they not looked to the birds above them? صَافَاتٍ وَيَقْبِضٍ Extending, with the wings extended and then flapping. With wings extended and then flapping. Now look at this. صَافَاتٍ وَيَقْبِضٍ That's the sabab. Normally, from, a, from the vantage point of physical cause and effect, physical laws, we would say that creates the flying. Like the scientists would attribute, right? What's the basis of flying is the motion of the wings that Allah Ta'ala Himself describes. What's the next statement? مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا Rahman. مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا Rahman. No one carries them except Ar-Rahman. The wings can't carry birds. The wind can't carry birds. Nothing can create anything. Allah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, and look at the wording. Ma yumsikuhunna illa. Negation, exception. This does not allow for co-sharing. Nothing and no one carries those birds illa rahman, except the all-merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is, this is exactly the creed of Ahl Sunnah. Hada khalqullah fa'aruni madha khalqu ladina min qabl, min duni. هذا خلق الله فأروني ماذا خلق الذين من دوني that this is the creation of Allah هذا everything we're experiencing every moment of our of our lives is the direct creation of Allah so show me what those less than Allah other than Allah can create show me what the water can create show me what the fire can create nothing without Allah's permission and this is the basis of miracles so when Ibrahim al Islam is thrown in the fire كوني بردا وسلاما على إبراهيم be cool and peaceful upon Ibrahim So just as Allah often creates the burning, He can at times choose to create whenever He wants, He can choose to create no burning. And that's the basis also now when we get to the story of Surah Al-Kahf. It's a miracle. And Allah Ta'ala Himself says, do you think it's wondrous that I can break the normal way I create things? So, so we'll get to that. But the oneness now, if a person then says no, I create my actions, or the cause creates the what the secondary cause, the thing in the world creates its effect. It's it's jahl of Allah's oneness. It's it's ignorance of Allah's oneness. Allah's oneness entails that He's the only creator. No one else shares in the attribute of creating. And so back to this ayah now, 
كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم. Like a person just says that. Like I, I, I reject that. You know, God is creating every single thing. He created the the world, and then it's unraveling on its own. كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم. What an enormous statement that just comes out of their mouths to attribute. Qudra to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, this applies then at any co compromise on the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any compromise with Allah's oneness, this ayah would be applicable by extension. Because Imam Qushayri, what does he says? That, وَمَن نَتَقَ بِمَا لَمْ يَحْسُلْ لَهُ بِهِ إِذْن لَحِقَهُ هَذَا الْوَصْفِ That whoever, whoever speaks uh, without permission, this des this description applies to him, and and no Muslim has the permission to say that the cause creates its effect. The permission we've been given from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is Allah is the creator of everything, Khaliqul Kulli Shay. This is the permission we've been given, and reason itself dictates this reality. So this should, this is very frightening. You know, that, and our Prophet ﷺ, he described in the hadith, a man would just let a word come out, not giving it any way, any concern, and that word will ca ca cause him to fall 70, you know, levels down into the fire. Just some word that gave, gave no thought, just said it. A word that just emerges from their mouths. Um, so, you know, not, not to speak without permission. Allah protect us. Okay, so those are the first five. Uh, verses verses six through eight. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "فلعلك باخع نفسك على آثارهم إن لم يؤمنوا بهذا الحديث أسفا إن جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا وإن لجائلون ما عليها سعيدا جرزا." So. Uh, this is addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. La'allaka, that per perhaps you baqi'u an nafsak, that baqi' is muhlik, is to destroy. Baqi' means muhlik, to destroy. And nafsaka is the direct object of baqi'. It's acting like a verb. So perhaps you are uh, Destroying your soul, destroying your very self. Ala atharihim upon their traces. In lam yu'minu bihad al hadithi asafa. If they if they do not believe in this hadith, so this hadith goes back to the kitab. This speech goes back to the book. Asafa out of grief, out of grief. Nam. So uh, Ibn Ajiba he comments in the tafsir portion. He says that. Uh, it's as if you're destroying yourself out of uh, grief and sorrow. That your people are turning away from faith and turning away from you. Upon their traces when they turn away from you. عندما تدعوهم إلى الله when you call them to Allah شبهه لأجل ما تداخله من الوجد على توليتهم بمن فار بمن فارقته فارقته عزته وهو ينحسر على آثارهم ويبخ نفسه وجدا عليهم that the wajd here means deep grief so it, you know when literally when the people that the Prophet was inviting to Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they would turn away in rejection and they would walk away, their footsteps would leave athar, the traces. And so Allah Ta'ala is describing the state of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What's his state, emotional state, when that happens? It's as if he's almost 
asafa is the mafulli ajlihi. Because of this incredible grief and sadness and concern for his people, he's almost destroying himself. On ala atharihim, on those very traces. Like at the time that they're turning away, on those very traces, this is the emotional state of our Prophet This is his universal concern. His concern is not limited to the people of Iman, it's for even the worst disbelievers. The concern of the Prophet ﷺ, this is described right now in the Qur'an, that you're almost, look, it's not just like feeling bad. <laughs> it's not just like, you know, that's too bad, and ma'alish, you know, and may Allah bless them, and fa'alaka bakhi'un nafsak. You know, you're almost killing yourself. Like the grief is almost destroying you. The grief is almost destroying you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At that moment, at that, upon their traces, because of this, how much concern and mercy that he has. Now, you know, what is our attitude toward, towards people who are disbelievers? What is our attitude towards people? You know, do we really want good for them? You know, the hadith of Imam Nawawi, uh, that's in the, in the Sahih, that it's in his Arba'in, that la yu'minu ahadukum, none of you have perfected iman, hatta yuhibba li akhihi. Ma yuhibbuli nafsi until he loves for his brother everything that he loves for himself. The ma is al umum until he loves for his, for his brother everything that he loves for himself. Imam Nawawi himself, rahimahullah, in his commentary, and many many other imams have said that this is ukhuwat adamiya. This is the Adamic brotherhood. That we, our iman is not complete until we love for even non-Muslims, even disbelievers, everything that we love for ourselves. Why everything? Because it starts with faith. And if we love faith for them such that they become believers, then we love all the joys and comforts for them as well. We want good for them in this life and the next, right? This is the, the attitude, this is the, this, is the, this is the highest level of prophetic character. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta. Your iman is not there yet. It's not, it's not reached its pinnacle yet until this happens. This is, this is the state of our prophet. This is reflected in this ayah and, and this is also وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to all realms of existence, to all, all sentient beings, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa Now, why do they turn away? So, ثُمَّ عَلَّلَ وَجْهَ إِدْبَارِهِمْ عَلِ الْإِيمَانِ Then Allah Ta'ala gives the explanation as to why they turn away from faith. Because they are deceived by the adornment of this life. Ultimately, anyone who rejects truth, it's because they have some incentive normally, which is because of the adornment of this life. Verily, we. And this is important. In Naja'alna, the adornment of the dunya as a test, Allah is the doer of it. As Allah is the doer of everything, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has, and He explains, subhanahu wa ta'ala explains why. So verily, we have made ma'al al ard, everything on the earth, every single thing on the earth, zina talaha, as an adornment for it, and a distractive adornment is what's it meant, because this is the, the context explaining why people turn away. Why people turn away. Like Abu Jahl admitted in a private conversation, the reason that he rejected the Prophet Wasallam is not because he didn't believe in him, was because that their tribe and the Prophet's Bani Hashim, they were always competing. And every time Bani Hashim did something, Abu Jahl's clan would do the, try to match it, to outdo them. When they were generous, they would try to be more generous. When they invited guests, they would try to invite more guests. When their reputation became that they were, you know, they had certain virtues, then Abu Jahl's clan tried to do that. He said, we were neck at neck, Banu Hashim and us, we were neck at neck like steeds in a race, about to approach the finish line. And right at the end point, before the finish line, one of them says, they have nubuwa from Allah. They have prophethood from God. And Abu Jahl says, how could we compete with that? And he says, he says, even though he was admitting, he knew that it's true, he said, by God, I'll never admit to this. I will fight this to, with my last breath. Okay? So what, what puts him in that mindset? Zinatul hayatul dunya. It's the adornment of this life. It's the, it's the prestige that he was getting for his clan. It's the notoriety that they were getting. Hubbul ja. It's the love of fame, the love of reputation. That's part of zinatul hayatul dunya, the part of the... 
in fact, Imam Ghazali says the highest zina of this life is love of uh, prestige. The very highest, the very greatest pleasure that a person can get of all the adornments of this life is one's prestige. Is one's prestige. And Imam Ghazali says once the believer can transcend that love such that they don't have the love of prestige anymore, their heart is pure of love of prestige, then he's amongst the Siddiqeen. Then he's amongst the, the highest tier of genuine, faithful servants of Allah, the highest tier of awliya, Siddiqeen. This is, but until a person can rid their heart of love of Jah, they can't get there. This is the greatest zina. This is what Abu Jahl prevented him from Iman. So Allah Ta'ala explains why. Why people turn away. Inna ja'alna ma'al al-ard. And they comment, they say, from the trees and the flowers and the fruits, all of the uh, minerals, the types of clothing, food, one's uh, vehicle, one's family, zinatan laha, it's all an adornment of, 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 the, of the earth. Linabluahum. Again, lam, we don't translate it in order to, with the consequence of. With the, with the consequence that Allah selected. He was not bound by any motives. With the consequence that we test them, ayyuhum ahsanu amala, which of them shall be most beautiful in works? Which of them shall be most beautiful in terms of works? Wa inna laja'iluna, and verily we, and then now the lam there is for extra emphasis, verily we undoubtedly are making ma'al, and notice it's ja'iluna. Like the first one, ja'alna, we made everything on earth and adornment of it. Like it's already done, the adornment's already done. It doesn't last. And then, but it's destruction, when it turns into nothingness, ja'iluna, we're doing it now. You notice the, the subtlety. The statement of its adornment, Allah Ta'ala used the past tense. It's, it's, a, done, it's a done thing. The statement of its falling and, and, and evaporating, as it were, turning into nothing of consequence, present tense. We are doing it. Wa inna la iluna. We are currently making ma alayha everything on the earth. Sa'id and juruza, you know, uh, dust, dried dust, dried dust, turab yabis. So. Ibn Ajima comments this on this zina. He says that yastamti'u biha nadirun. The people looking at it find joy in it. Wa yantafi'una biha makkalan wa malbasa wa nadaran wa atibara, and they take benefit from it in the food, in the clothing, in what they see, in what they contemplate. Hatta in al hayat wal aqarib. Even snakes and scorpions are an adornment of this world. Min haythu tathkiruha bi adab al akhirah, because they remind us of the punishment of the next life. Even the, so this is addressing theodicy a little bit, that even what we consider as evil, evil or harmful is an adornment because it reminds us of the akhirah, that the punishment of the fire. So there's a benefit there. بَلْ كُلُّ حَادِثْ دَاخِلْ تَحْتَ الزِّينَ مِنْ حَيْثُ دَلَالَتُهُ عَلَى الصَّانِعِ In fact, every event in this world is subsumed under the category of zina, adornment, insofar as it indicates its creator. Every single event in this world is subsumed in the category of adornment insofar as it indicates its creator. وَكَذَلِكَ الْأَزْوَاجُ وَالْأَوْلَادِ The same applies to one's family and children. بَلْ هُمْ مِنْ أَعْضَمِ زِينَتِهَا In fact, that's, that's of the greatest of the adornment, right? The beauty of a man's life is his family. دَاخِلُونَ تَحْتَ الْإِبْتِلَاءِ All of this then is under the test. If it's in the zina, it's being tested. So every single event then is a test for us, ultimately. And every enjoyment is a test for us. Are we, does it make us turn more towards Allah or does it distract us from Allah? 
Does it make us turn towards more to Allah or does it distract us from Allah? So the Prophet ﷺ, he enjoyed the zina of this life. He enjoyed his family ﷺ. He enjoyed food ﷺ. Although he was very, he did not have much food ﷺ, but he appreciated the blessings of Allah. He enjoyed drink, he enjoyed company, he enjoyed all of these blessings. The Prophet enjoyed them ﷺ. And various Prophets at different degrees, Suleyman ﷺ enjoyed arguably the most in terms of number of worldly blessings. All of the wealth and the control of the jinn and control of the wind and all of these things. So in and of itself, the zina is not necessarily haram. But what's the state of the heart vis-a-vis -vis the zina? Okay, and this is why Ibn Atala gives a beautiful principle as to how we see the world. He says that al-akwan dhahiruha zina, dhahiruha ghirra, wa batinuha ibra. He says, anything that's created has an outward and an inward. The outward of it is ghirra, is delu delusional, delu delusion. The outward of it deludes us. Wa ibra, but the inward of it reminds us. The inward of it reminds us. Fa an nafsu tandru ila zahiri ghirratiha, wal qalbu yandru ila batani ibratiha. So the, the ego, what is distant from the remembrance of Allah, it gets, its gaze gets fixed on the glitter of the outward, on the delusion aspect, the delusionary aspect of the outward. But the heart that's purified, that's seeking the remembrance of Allah, penetrates to the inward of its ibra, of what it points to, of what it points to. So anytime, back to the prophets, whenever they're with the blessings, they're with Allah. This is the point. Whenever they're with the blessings, they're with Allah. They don't see the blessings as divorced from Allah. So this is one of the dangers of blessings because it's outwardly so glittery, outwardly so full of joy and pleasure that the person forgets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They get infatuated with the blessing and they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the heart of the person who's directing themselves to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it penetrates past the joy and it sees it as coming from Allah. It sees it as a gift from Allah, not just a gift, not just a ni'mah, but ni'mah to Allah. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ Allah. Anything that you have a blessing, it's directly from Allah. It's directly gifted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why someone who gets caught up in the outward of the dunya alone, this is a sign of no intellect. So if we want a prophetic gauge of our intellect, okay, we go to the hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, dunya dar man la dar lah. This life is a, an abode of someone with no abode. This life is a, an abode for someone with no abode. Authentic hadith. Walaha yajma'u man la aqla lah. And the only person that seeks to gather it is someone without intelligence. The only person that seeks to gather it is someone lacking intelligence. So if we are stuck with the outward glitter, According to our Prophet la lana. We have zero aql, zero intellect. There's no intelligence there. But if we're penetrating to the inward reality of blessings, that it's Allah's favor upon us. It's Allah's minna, Allah's, Allah's gift. So we don't see the blessing, we see the mun'im. We don't see the ni'mah, we see the mun'im. We don't see the thing itself, we see the giver of the thing. And then we thank Allah then this is a sign of intelligence. This is why Sidi Abu Hassan, al-Shadari rahimahullah, he said anytime you get a new gift from Allah, you should say, Hasbunallah, sayyutin Allahu min fadlihi wa rasuluh, inna ila Allahi raghibun, from Surah At-Tawbah. Hasbunallah, he says anytime you get an increase in your deen or dunya, in your religious life or your worldly life, say, Hasbunallah, say, immediately say, Allah is my sufficiency. Like the thing isn't doing anything for me. Allah is sufficing me right now. So, so the, attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attributing the benefit and the pleasure directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then does this mean we don't want the gifts? No, we want more gifts from Allah. So then how does the ayah continue? Sayyutin Allahu min fadlihi. Allah will continue to give us from his bounty. Wa rasuluhu. And his messenger also gives. His messenger also gives. Because this ayah was revealed with the context of the, distributing the spoils, the messenger was distributing the blessings to the companions. But 
do, do, is that what we're seeking? So we ask Allah for more gifts, but are, are we ultimately seeking those gifts? How does the ayah end? Inna ilallahi raghibun. Verily Allah alone do we desire. Verily Allah alone do we desire. It's a beautiful summation of the attitude of the mu'min towards gifts. Is that the, uh, the sufficiency is not from the gift, it's from Allah. But we ask Allah for more. We don't want that Allah withhold them. But in our asking for more, we're still seeking Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our desire is for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then commenting, we'll uh, wrap up now. Ayyuhum ahsuna amala, which of them is most beautiful in his deed? Meaning what? In the context of the glitter of dunya, ayyuhum azhadu fiha. So the explanation of the most beautiful deed is the one who is least attached to this world. The one who's least attached to this world. Wa aqbaluhum ala Allah bil amal salih. And the one who's most directing himself to Allah with righteous works. Id la amal ahsan min al zuhd fid dunya. Because there's no deed more beautiful than being dis disattached from this life. There's no deed more beautiful than being indifferent to this world. Because this is the basis of freeing yourself for the different forms of worship in terms of both your body and your heart. Qala Abu Saud, Abu Saud Effendi, the great Shaykh al-Islam, Ottoman, uh, Qadi al qada head of the Supreme Court of the Ottoman uh, uh, Abu Saud Effendi, who has uh, Irshad al Aql al Salim, his tafsir is called Guiding the Sound Intellect. He says, Rahimullah, wa husnul amal al zuhud fiha. The beautiful act, beautiful works here, means not being attached to this life. Wa adam al iktirath biha, and being indifferent towards your world, your, your, your personal, uh, your, the dunya. Wa al qana'atu bil yasir minha, and being satisfied with just a little bit of it. Wa sarfuha ala ma yambaghi, and spending this world for what's appropriate. Wa ta'amul fi sha'niha, and contemplating its nature. Wa ja'luha dhari'atan ila ma'rifati khaliqaha, and making this world a means for getting to know its creator. Wa tamattu biha. This is important, but still enjoying this world as long as within what the Sharia has allowed. So we're not saying you can't enjoy the world. Right? The Prophet ﷺ enjoyed the world, and different prophets enjoyed different portions of the world. So the dunya is okay in the hand, but not in the heart. This is the key. The dunya is okay in the hand, even a lot of it. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as it's not in the heart. So as long as it's within what the Sharia has permitted, then to enjoy it. And to fulfill the rights of it. And to be thankful for its blessings. Not making it a means to fulfill lusts and, and uh, corrupt uh, intentions. So, just connecting it now uh, to. Allah Ta'ala mentioning this after mentioning the concern that the Prophet had, his grief over their rejection, that Ibn Ajiba comments that uh, وَيَحْتَمِلْ أَنْ يَكُنْ تَسْلِيَةً لِلْنَبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم it's, it's, it's possible that this is a consolation for the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنْ حَيْثُ إِنَّهُ أَرْشَدَهُ إِلَى شُهُودِ تَدْبِيرِ الْحَقِّ from the perspective that Allah is guiding the Prophet to witness Allah's action فَيَسْلُو such that he is, uh, he is consoled بِذَلِكْ عَنْ إِعْرَادِهِمْ he's consoled thereby from their, the turning away of the disbelievers لِغَيْبَتِهِ Fi al musawwir al mudabbir an sur the one because he is completely then immersed in the giver of forms, the one who is determining all forms from the forms themselves. Wa an zina fil muzayyin and from the from the adornment to the one giving adornment. Fal kawn madharu sifat wa miratuha because the world is a theophany of Allah's attributes and a mirror of God's traits. Wa fi that and that and and that the Prophet is is absent in the divine being itself. which is the basis of the world. Be if not al-dahir, if not al-af'al, kama nabba alayhi bi qawli wa inna la So what he's saying here, Allah Allahu alam, is that if you look, 
what's the relationship between ayahs 6, 7, and 8? Ayah 6 says that the Prophet ﷺ is almost destroying himself out of genuine sorrow and grief that the disbelievers are turning away. And then Allah Ta'ala immediately says, we are the ones who adorn this wor world, this earth. And, and, and the consequence is that we are testing them about their actions, how beautiful they are, and we are the ones making this earth dry and dust. Meaning that turn the gaze towards Allah and not the vicissitudes of the world. That when things don't go our way, we direct our hearts to Allah. We direct our hearts to Allah because ultimately Allah is controlling everything. You know, no, no one is acting apart from their destiny. So when the disbelievers are rejecting, even though they have their choice, they're accountable for that choice, it's still Allah's destiny unfolding. So directing the gaze, not from the actions of those people, but to Allah, who's the one who set up all the world, who set up all the adornment, who's created the, this arena of testing, and who ultimately his destiny is unfolding in their turning away. So, so shifting the gaze from the suwar to the musawwir, from the forms to the giver of forms. So inshallah is a good closing point. Inshallah next week we'll start the actual, or the week after next, after Eid, the actual story of the Ashab al-Kahf. So if there's any questions, inshallah, we can quickly try to address them. Yeah, so Allahu Alam, uh, the question is that reconciling, forgetting deeds as a sign of their acceptance with the enjoyment that we have with certain deeds, the fact that uh, there's a hadith of the people trapped in the cave, different from the story of the cave, but in another complete different, completely different incident, the people who were stuck in a cave and they mentioned their good deeds and did tawassal through, to Allah SWT through their good deeds in the cave, the rock opened for them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these aren't necessar necessarily mutually exclusive that we can, we definitely should embrace deeds that we find enjoyable. This is one of the secrets that you notice there's many hadith about the Prophet وسلم, telling people the best of deeds is su such and such. So the best of deeds is someone who learns the Quran and teaches it. The best of deeds is someone who, and it's different, there's many, many hadith of different specific things, but it starts with the best of, de the best of deeds. One of the wisdoms of that is that the Prophet is addressing people who Allah is opening that deed for them and they're finding enjoyment in it. So for them specifically, it's the best of deeds. Meaning that if we are naturally inclined towards certain good acts and there's a tawfiq in it, there's an opening in it and we're, Allah's positioned us to do it and we can do it, especially with service and or study or there's people that they go into knowledge, for example, it opens up and they enjoy it. People that go into service or community work and it opens up and they enjoy it. People that go into, you know, there's so many different arenas of, of uh, work that we can do for Allah. And then of course our private, whether people are really connected to Quran, some people are really connected to Salawat and the Prophet Wasallam. There's like addicted, right? Some people are really connected to Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. Some people are connected to this dhikr of Allah's name, Allah, Allah. Some people, there's different, you know, some people, charity, they just can't get enough of charity. Every opportunity, I'm going to give another, and I'm going to write another check, and I'm going to use my credit card and online, and they just, it's just such a, this feedback. So we should embrace that feedback. That's a gift from Allah, and ultimately, it's, a, it's, the, it's simply the location where Allah is manifesting His destiny, that each of us has a destiny, and Allah, the, the, the himma that we have to do certain good and the enjoyment that we have are all area you know, places where Allah is unfolding His destiny, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should embrace that. Kullun muyassurun lima khuliqala. You know, everyone's destiny is made easy for them. So that is definitely, but to, 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 hold, to keep in mind, so there, there's a difference between that versus always just sitting back and thinking how special one is because of remembering these good deeds. You know, so the person who's been doing community work for 30 years and they're so adept at it and they've refined it so much and they have so many connections that they're able to really just take it to the next level, they should wake up every morning thinking, I still haven't done anything for Allah. It's still like, alhamdulillah, that's Allah gift, gifted me those good deeds, whatever, that's really Allah's, uh, you know, 
whatever you find of good, right? Whoever finds good, let him praise Allah. ومن وجد غير ذلك فلا يلومنا إلا نفسه. Whoever finds other other than that, let him blame no one but himself. So the the point is that with each new day, it's a new it's it's like a clean slate. We should see it as it's like I have zero good deeds, and I have a lot of work to do if I want to get to get to paradise. So this is inshallah one way to to reconcile it. So we we still recall certain things, especially big things, but we don't reminisce. Reminisce. No, Allah knows best. Any, any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the question that does the Islamic tradition have literature or an emphasis on reflecting on the natural world, contemplation of the natural world as a means of getting to know God. So yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, first, it's firstly in the Quran itself that all of these, you know, all of these, all of this adornment of the dunya is uh, these are ayat of Allah. These are signs of Allah indicating his, and we read today, Ibn Ajiba said that in fact every hadith, every event is, is, a, uh, is from the zina, is from the world's adornment, min haythu dalalatuhu ala sanih, insofar as it signifies its creator. So, so the Quran is the first place you know, to, to find that emphasis of reflecting the, on the natural world. And then there's many, many books you know, that mention like teleolo teleological arguments for the existence of God. Imam Ghazali has a book about the makhluqatullah uh, where he goes through different aspects. And it's in the Ihya, all throughout the Ihya he really focuses on. There's areas where he focuses on biology as a wonder of God, digestion as a wonder of God. In the uh, Kitab al-Shukr, I believe, you know, he goes through the digestive process and shows how this is a wonder of God. Uh, so Imam Ghazali, he has a lot of work on this and uh, many, many others. No. Yeah, so the question, uh, how one's in, the intention of a person reconciles the, the fact that this world is temporary, yet the recompense is forever. So it's because the intention of every person is a perpetual intention. So uh, the believer never has the intention that one day they'll let go of that iman, uh, God forbid. And the disbeliever, so long as he is a disbeliever, has no intention of changing. So it's a, it's a perpetual intention, and so therefore the recompense is, is perpetual. Um, and this, that's one you know, perspective, that, that's Ghazali's perspective, Rahimullah. You know, there, there might be others that one I've mentioned, so Allah knows best. Um. How do you continue the himma we fluctuate up and down? Or how do you continue himma which fluctuates up and down? So how do we keep it growing? And then secondly, how can we protect ourselves from becoming amazed with ourselves when we are talking about committing good deeds? In other words, to inspire others as well. The same when talking about the dean and giving advice and so forth. Sorry, say the last part, the same way what? The same when talking about the dean and giving advice to others, how do we prevent ourselves from becoming amazed with ourselves. Oh, okay. And the first question was about how do we continue and keep him a going, him which a going obviously high. fluctuates. Yeah. You know, so alhamdulillah, first thing is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, la izalu lisanuka ratban bi dhikrillah. The hadith says that let your tongue always be moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So asking Allah for help, for tawfiq. Um, that we have him, uh, you know, we're human beings, and especially in our times, especially with uh, the challenges that we face and the way many of us were raised, you know, laziness is a big problem, spiritual sloth, uh, not realizing the value of time, you know, these are the salaf were very, very different. If we were around, if we had a glimpse of the day of one of the salaf, we'd probably be shocked that people actually live like that. So, you know, with, with our technology and how much time we just spend online, and we have a lot of challenges in terms of getting some serious himma to do something good. So, uh, so we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, to, to, to make us people of himma. Another big thing is company. Birds of a fl feather flock together, right? Birds of a feather flock together. So suhbah is really important. We should find people that have himma you know, if we're around lazy people, we'll get lazier. If we're around people of himma, we'll have more himma. We'll have more zeal and 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 uh, you know enthusiasm and strength. 
So uh, that's why, you know, one of them said, Abu Khair al-Aqta, uh, he, uh, he died in the year 340. He has a statement, Ma balagha ahadun ila halatin sharifatin illa bi arba'a. No one ever reached a noble state except by four things. Allah uh, 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 that mulazamatul muwafaqa wa mu'anaqatul adab wa ada'ul fara'id wa suhbatul salihin. Naam. He says that uh, the, no one ever reached a noble state except through four things. Mulazamatul muwafaqa, that, you know, holding fast to corresponding with the sharia, holding fast to corresponding with what Allah wants. Second thing, mu'anaqatul adab, embracing etiquette, embracing character and etiquette and comportment and proper behavior. The third thing, wa ada'ul fara'id, and fulfilling the obligations fulfilling the obligations of Islam. And the fourth thing, which is why we're mentioning it, was suhbatul salihin, and the company of the righteous. So if we can hold on to company of the righteous, we'll have a noble state, and we'll also have higher uh, himma. Uh, the second one, how to not be amazed with oneself in the context of giving advice uh, that, um, you know, just to remember our sins, remember our pathetic times, how bad we've been, and and it's like reality. It's not even humility, it's just reality, being real with ourselves. Some some of them have said this is one of the wisdoms of, of the committing of sins, that sometimes Allah Ta'ala decrees a sin for a believer just to keep them humble. You know, so, so those times where we messed up, the times where we did something wrong, just remembering that, making tawbah, and, and, and so, you know, if it's something like years before, decades before, and we've completely abandoned that haram, then we shouldn't think about it anymore. But things that we've recently struggled with, you know, that we need to really get toba going for them and, and climb out of those things, we should remember that to, to remember our lowliness, so not be impressed with. And also just to see, like we read today, the Ubudiya entails al qiyam bi haqq ta'at bi sharat tawqir and the third one is part of the answer that to, real, to, to, to realize and witness and perceive all of your achievements <coughs> excuse me all of your achievements as directly from the divine decree so in the context you're giving advice to someone and something of your practice or your you know uh, spiritual works comes up you know, then just to see it as decreed from Allah, it's nothing about you. It's nothing inherent about you that, that caused it. It's all the, only Allah's decree being manifested. So all of that, all of the good that, that we've done is Allah's decree and all of the bad is our choices. No, any other questions? Alhamdulillah. Um, Alhamdulillah. I'm not sure if I understand exactly the question, but, but we should venerate Allah in every um, phenomenon. So whether we're looking at the natural world and looking at what we owe to Allah, dealing with fellow people, we should be venerating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, our veneration of each other is from the veneration of Allah, if that's what you're asking. Our ven, when we, you know, Ibn Masruq, a Shafi scholar and muhaddith, he says that ta'zim hurumat al-mu'minin min ta'zim hurumat Allah. Wa bihi yasir al-abd ila mahal haqiqat al-taqwa. He says that venerating the sanctity of your fellow believer is from your veneration of Allah himself. And this is the, <coughs> this is the means by which a servant reaches the station of taqwa, the, excuse me, the reality of taqwa, the haqiqat of taqwa, is by venerating each other. So when we, we should venerate each other as that's from our veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. So it applies both with respect to people and in general in the world, you know, and Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah. We should wrap up. Wa salli Allahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabiya Nami wa ala alihi wa sahbi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Inshallah, early Eid Mubarak. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.